Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. Our topic today is mental health parity, and I am joined by Cheryl Hughes, who is a principal and an attorney in our law and policy group, and my go-to resource for mental health parity. Thanks for being here today, Cheryl. Oh, sure. Thanks for having me, Tracy. And we certainly have been very busy lately <laughs> with this. So when we think about mental health parity, you know, we've been at this for a while. In 2008, mental health parity was expanded to include addiction, which is how we got to the acronym MAPIA. And that is 15 years ago that that happened. And so if we fast forward to current times, um, this summer we received a whole package of information from the agencies, lots of, lots of uh, documents in there. And Cheryl, I'd like to start with the report to Congress. Tell us what you think the meaningful takeaways are for employers from that report. Okay, thanks, Tracy. Um, you know, regulators put this report together after spending over two years reviewing more than 200 NQTLs, um, NQTL comparative analysis reports from plan sponsors and issuers. And NQTL is a plan's non-quantitative rules that can limit benefits. So they can be subjective, things like pre-authorization or concurrent review. And major takeaways are that regulators are seeking to improve mental health care and substance use disorder care, and I'll call those both behavioral health together, um, those benefits and group health plans through enforcement and rulemaking, so both methods. Um, they're focused on expanding access to in-network behavioral health providers and they continue, unfortunately, to receive insufficient responses when they are doing these reviews. So some plan sponsors may not even have an NQTL comparative analysis report. Uh, but the regulators are working collaboratively with plan sponsors and issuers to reach compliance. Uh, very few employers were named as being non-compliant, which was one purpose of this report. Um, so we were pleased to see that. Um, and regulators provided many, many helpful examples of voluntary corrections that employers could, could take a look at and use themselves if they discovered something uh, in their plan that needed to be corrected. And the re finally, the regulators added two new priority areas um, to this growing list of enforcement priorities that they have. Uh, the first is, is for impermissible exclusions of key treatments, so things like ABA for autism spectrum disorders, or MAT for substance use disorders, or nutritional counseling for eating disorders. And very importantly, they added network adequacy standards for behavioral health providers as another new priority area. Expanding access to mental health services has been one of the top three priorities for employers. And in fact, in 2021, it was the number one priority for jumbo employers. So clearly it's something that they're very focused on. So that's kind of the first point here. Um, the second point is that it is, there is an access crisis in our country. You know, there's data that's produced by the Health Resources Services Administration that has documented that there's over like 6,000 areas in the U.S where 165 million people live, that there's a documented shortage of mental health providers. And so this is something that, you know, not only, you know, do employers recognize, but it's an issue for everyone. I will say, though, that there are some things that employers have been doing over the past couple of years to try to expand access. For starters, about 70% of employers have expanded their employee assistance plans, including not just having the, the types of services provided be more robust, but also including the number of visits that are covered. And about half of all employers have added a supplemental network for behavioral health, whether it's in person or for virtual care. And this is something that we've been looking at very closely, you know, as we think about um, comments to share and data to share with the regulators. And so, Cheryl, you and I were talking, and one of the things that we really wanted to know, kind of the $10 million question is, did we make a difference in the expansions that employers have made? And so we worked together with our data warehouse team and were able to come up with some really interesting data. 
And so for starters, just looking at the number of people that access behavioral health services pre-pandemic, it was around 7%, 7.5% of people, so plan members or their family members that were getting behavioral health care services. If you fast forward to the most recent quarter in 2023, we're up at almost 10%. And so that's almost a 3% increase in plan members that are getting behavioral health services. Right. So that's more people getting services, but we also have data on visits. So more people and more visits. More visits. And so in the visit category, we've documented a 29% increase in the number of visits. So we've gone from no visits that were virtual pre-pandemic to 30% of visits today are through some type of virtual means. And that's actually sustained pretty well over the past several quarters. Right. We did see a huge spike, of course. I think everyone is probably well aware of that. There was a huge spike in the second quarter of 2020 when the pandemic began. But I think what's been somewhat surprising is the sustained utilization of the telehealth for behavioral health. So yeah. really, really positive improvement to access. Yeah. So what a coincidence, 29 percent um, increase in the number of visits and 30 percent of them are virtual care. So I would say that's a pretty strong case for virtual care expanding access for behavioral health services. So all good. Yes, I agree. And I'm so happy that our data warehouse folks were able to pull this together for us. So it's wonderful data. Yes. Shout out to them. So it seems like, you know, staying with this theme of access, it seems like the regulators are really focused on access as well. And so in the proposed rules, how are you seeing this show up in, um, in their proposals? So the White House actually describes the proposed rules as increasing access to behavioral health benefits, especially in network care. And they, they have you know, said that th that's in line with the president's national mental health strategy. So very important strategy to increase access. Um, and, and this focus on increasing access really is driving many of the new provisions of the rules, the proposed rules. So maybe the biggest change, there are two new tests for NQTLs. There's a numerical testing similar to what we're, we're already doing for financial limits like copays. But there's also a brand new outcomes data test that's pretty extensive. Um, so specifically, plans will be or would be, if these are finalized, required to collect and evaluate certain data, including claims denials, to assess a, a particular NQTL's impact on access. So how does a particular provision impact a participant's access to behavioral health care? So it would include um, you know, in-network and out-of-network utilization rates, time and distance data, and data on providers who are accepting new patients. So that's a key piece of this as well. And the final regulations, we think, also probably will include a non-enforcement safe harbor that is specifically related to network composition. Okay, very interesting. So a lot um, that has been proposed there, um, but it's you know likely going to take a bit of time before we get to final regulations. And so, Cheryl, just you know, what is your sort of parting advice for employers in terms of things that they need to be focused on as it relates to mental health parity? Yeah, so employers really need to make sure they are complying with the current MAPIA rules given the agency's current focus on enforcement, and we expect that to continue. Um, so employers should review the, their current plan limits on behavioral health, including NQTLs, and the plan's comparative analysis. And if you don't have one, you need to get one as soon as you can. Um, the agencies have been really clear that they, they expect um, to see all plan sponsors having those comparative analysis. Um, try to add outcomes data to your comparative analysis as well when you can. We know it can be hard to get that data. Uh, but at the very least, make sure you can obtain that outcomes data if one of the regulators comes and asks you for it. Also, consider what changes you may want or need to make um, in light of, again, both enforcement and potential rulemaking. So look at your network adequacy. How can you improve access under your plan? 
uh, and access to your network. Um, and document your efforts. That may be helpful to you if um, you ever do get that call from the regulators. And then I would also suggest doing a cost-benefit analysis of NQTLs like pre-authorization and concurrent review. So do the pros still outweigh the cons for those particular NQTLs? Again, given that those have become an enforcement priority, so you need to be very careful with those particular NQTLs. And so just to wrap up, I mean, the proposed rules are just that for now. They are proposals, but the agencies do expect that the rules, if they are finalized, will be effective for the 2025 plan year. That is not far off. Um, so we really do think it makes sense to begin thinking about what these rules mean for your plan and making changes, you know, to get ready for that. So Cheryl, thank you so much. That's a great list of things for employers to stay focused on. Really appreciate um, all that you've shared with us today. Lots of good advice. And for, um, for the employers out there, thank you for the good work that you're doing. The increase that we've seen in people getting care and accessing care is really great. Clearly, we all still have a lot of work to do, but just appreciate all the effort that's gone into this. So thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks, everyone.